All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MOS Live. You're here for our live animal presentation about species survival plans. My name is Becca, my pronouns are she and her, and today I'm going to be your moderator. So what that means is I will be looking at any questions that come in through Zoom or any observations and sharing them with our live animal center friends. Now, uh, if you're joining us on Zoom and you would like to ask any questions, you can click the Q&A box at the bottom or top of your screen and type them in. And if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, we are very excited that you're here today, but please note that we cannot see any of your questions or comments at this time. If you're joining us on Zoom and would like closed captions, you're more than welcome to hit the closed caption button and click show subtitle. So I think it's time that we jump right in and meet our first animal. Hello everyone, my name is Corey. I'm the invertebrate keeper here at the Museum of Science. And with me today is Liz, who is our assistant curator for our live animal center. So for those of you who join us regularly, you may notice we're in a very different location. And that is because we are actually in our live animal center. So you'll see some enclosures behind me. You also may be hearing some chattering and some very loud tortoises banging around because they're just right over here. So uh, that's all that noise is you guys are hearing. So today we're gonna talk about species survival plans. So I'm gonna go ahead and have Liz introduce our first animal. So our first animal for our species survival plan is our Mexican red knee tarantula. So a lot of you may be asking, what is a species survival plan? And that's a great question. So it is um, a program set up to help breed uh, animals in captivity so we can keep good genetics and uh, positive numbers in our zoos, aquariums, and museums. This program is also set up to eventually, hopefully, be able to release species back into the wild and help with population numbers. So uh, some of the, the animals you guys are going to be seeing today are animals that are in those programs. Um, that we have homes for here at the museum. So this uh, tarantula, you may not, you know, think of them right off the bat, but these guys are threatened in the wild. The genus in general um, of this species is endangered, and their biggest thing is that they are really, really popular in the pet trade. So a lot of people have gone into the wild and collected these, and then, um, and then sold them as pets. And that has really hurt their population. So it's always important when you're looking at getting a new animal that you know exactly, especially if it's um, an exotic animal, you know exactly where it's coming from. So our uh, Mexican red knee tarantula here is actually from another institution where it was bred. So Mexican red knees live in Mexico as their name suggests. And they have a pretty small area that they live. Their habitat also has, their habitat range has also decreased over the, over the years. So these tarantulas can actually live to be over 20 years old. That's normally the females. With tarantulas, male tarantulas only live to be about five or seven years old, but females can live over 20. How crazy is that? Because a lot of people, when we think about spiders, we think that they're going to be these shorter lived animals, but 20 years. So what makes our Mexican red knee tarantula also super cool is she has urticating hairs. So these are hairs on uh, the back of her body that she will actually rub together when she feels threatened and they get released into the air. And then they're very irritating. So if you get them on your skin, or if you breathe them in or they go into your eye, they're super irritating. Um, and they can actually, if you breathe them in, they can cause it to be really hard for you to breathe. So I have gotten these hairs in my hands and I can tell you it really, really hurt. My hands were swollen for about two weeks. They were bright red and really, really itchy. So it's not fun. So whenever we use these guys or whenever we have to move them, we use gloves. You also see, Liz is holding our camera over our animal's enclosure. So our Mexican red knee, she doesn't have to. If she wants to, she can go hide. She can move somewhere else. And we're giving her that option. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over and see if anyone has any questions. 
Sure, we have a lot of questions coming in so far. Uh, many people, um, actually quite a few, have been asking how old is she and what is her name? That's a great question. So it's definitely hard for us to tell the age of, um, of tarantulas when they come in. So we got her as an adult, so we're not exactly sure how old she is, but we're guessing she's around seven to 10 years old um, because she is fully matured. Um, so that's kind of our best guess, but it is definitely hard with tarantulas unless you know their exact birth year. Um, it is hard to know their age. Awesome. And a lot of people are wondering, um, including Kimberly, what do they eat? Great question. So these guys are carnivores and they are a sit and wait predator. So they're an ambush predator. These guys like to burrow down and kind of web around uh, the front of their, their burrow. So when, um, you know, an insect or a small mammal or an amphibian or um, reptile goes over that, they're able to kind of see and feel it and they dart out, grab it and kind of pull it back in. So these guys are really great ambush hunters, but you're not gonna see them kind of walking around and, um, hu and hunting for food like we would kind of maybe see like a large cat or something like that. Very cool. Um, and we have a few people noticing that this spider is not moving. So they're wondering why and is it sleeping? That's a great question. So in a sense, yeah, she's just resting. Um, spiders don't sleep. They kind of go into a rest period. Um, so that's kind of what she's doing right now. This is also her home. So this is just where she's decided to hang out. A lot of tarantulas um, are nocturnal. So this species is nocturnal. And that means they come out and kind of are more active at night and um, are less active or resting during the day. And we actually have to pay attention to that. So we make sure we're giving good care to our tarantulas. One of them, um, we can tell how active she is at night because she climbs up the side of her tank and she webs all the way around. But in the morning, she comes straight back down and sits in the same spot every day. But so we look at those things to see what our animals are doing when we're not here. So sure, Molly, age 11 is wondering how big can they get? That's a great question. So it's definitely challenging to see how big this tarantula is in, um, in this video. So this species, this individual right here is probably about the size of my palm. Um, they can get a little bit larger. Once they're adults, they're kind of full grown. So I would say probably the diameter of, um, not my whole hand, but a little bit bigger than my palm is like the biggest they will get. Where you see a lot of size change in tarantulas once they become adults is their, is their abdomen is the end of their body. So if um, we're looking at their abdomen, it, that'll actually show us if the tarantula has enough water, if the tarantula is eating enough. So um, just like us humans, if she's eating a little bit more, her abdomen will be a little bit rounder. If she's eating a little bit less, it'll be thinner. Um, but if it's wrinkly, we know she's dehydrated. So there's all sorts of little signs that we look for to make sure that our animals are eating and that they have enough water. So a few people are wondering, um, why do females live longer than males? Such a good question. So, Male tarantulas, they reach sexual maturity pretty quickly. I believe it's within a year or two. Again, this is gonna be different depending on what species you're looking at. Um, female tarantulas, they're gonna put a lot more energy and care into making eggs. So if you invest into a lifespan, that's gonna be a lot longer. She's gonna be able to produce more eggs and make more baby tarantulas over that time. Where the male, he's gonna be able to take those risks of going to find the female. He's going to be able to be out in the open a little bit more to go do those things where she is going to be more stay where she is and wait for the male to come to her because she has that important job of making babies and, and having them. Um, so that takes a lot of energy. Great. So we have um, quite a few questions wondering, are they venomous or are they poisonous? And maybe it's also a chance to explain the difference between that. Yeah, that's great. So uh, tarantulas are venomous. So all spiders are venomous. It just depends on the intensity of the venom. 
So our Mexican red meat here, they do have venom. They can bite because they do have fangs, um, but it's really mild venom. It would be, you know, I'd be more worried about the fact that you had these two large fangs go into your hand than necessarily the venom. Um, it will swell a little bit, but it's not gonna be too bad. So Becca also brought up a really good point of what's the difference between venomous and poisonous. So poisonous is something if you rub it on your skin or ingest it, so like poison ivy, or if you ate a berry, that's poisonous. Venom is something that's injected into your skin. Um, so that is what we consider venomous, so like a snake or a tarantula where poison is rubbed or ingested. Awesome. Thanks for that, Corey. Um, we have so many questions. Um, people are wondering a little bit about, uh, let's see, why do they have red spots on their legs? A few people have asked that, including Maddie, age 10. That's a great observation. So the red, the red segments on their body, it's such a great observation. And I don't have a, a solid answer for why. Um, some things that would stick out immediately are, again, being a warning to other animals. I do a venom. I can bite you. Um, you're going to want to stay away from me. Just because venom is super interesting that just because as humans, we may not have a bad reaction to it, another animal may have a bad reaction. So an amphibian is going to process that venom a lot differently than we are. So whatever that... Um, whatever animals are in our Mexican red meat territory, it's evolved to, to have those, um, those markings, that red color to possibly ward off predators, to possibly blend in with its um, environment. Again, these guys are going to be in a little, kind of going to be like a desert meets forest, so a little more like deciduous tropical forest kind of deal. Awesome. And I know we do have another species to get to. So I think we will just take one more question for now. Uh, and this is a great question because I relate to it a lot. Um, why are people so scared of tarantulas? That's a fantastic question. So there's kind of two main reasons. Um, the first one is they have eight legs and they can move very quickly. So in general, I think uh, for a lot of people, it's the startle factor. When you walk in someplace, you're not expecting a tarantula or a spider to be on the wall, on the floor. And it's just really startling. Like I love spiders, I love tarantulas, but I can tell you if I turn on a light at my house and I'm not expecting it and there's a big spider, I jump, I'm scared. Um, so I think that's the first one. The second one is our perception. We have been told for so long that cockroaches are gross, tarantulas are scary, snakes are scary and dangerous. So these are things that we're told, which makes sense. You know, if you're told something over and over, you're going to believe it. So with the tarantulas, we're just told from when we're a young age that we should be scared of them. And some people, you know, learn about these animals and become more empathetic and understanding and, and love them. And other people just continue to be scared. And that's okay. It's okay to be scared of these animals. Thank you for that. I know I am uh, personally scared of them. So I relate to that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> now I am going to share my screen as we get ready for our next animal. I know that there were a lot of unanswered questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them, but hopefully this screen here gives you a little bit more information and maybe also answer some of those questions that we didn't have time to get to. So feel free to take a picture of this slide so you can learn a little bit more about our Mexican red knee tarantula. And then when our next animals are ready, we'll head over to them. I think we are just about ready. I'll give you a brief uh, kind of preview of what the animal is. I'm actually really excited for you guys to see our next animal. This is an animal that is typically on exhibit here at the museum, but their exhibit is being refurbished right now. So we actually have them up close in our live animal center. So this animal is a mammal. And I think if Corey is ready, I'm gonna have her turn our camera on and you can see them up close. Now these animals move pretty quickly. So hopefully Corey will be able to keep up with them as they move about in their enclosure. 
Now you guys are probably thinking right away, monkey, and you are absolutely correct. These are monkeys. They are called cotton top tamarind. Now cotton top tamarinds belong to a family of monkeys that are called calatricans. Sounds like a confusing name, but it includes all tamarinds and then marmosets, if you've heard of them. So another small kind of monkey. Now cotton top tamarinds in the wild are native to Northwestern Colombia. They live in tropical forests and that is the only place you will find them in the wild. Now these animals like our tarantula are endangered. More specifically, they are critically endangered. That means they are in serious trouble. There are estimates that there are less than 6,000 of these animals living out in the wild, which is pretty sad. Now you may wonder, how did they get into so much trouble? Why are they so endangered? There are actually a couple different reasons. One is habitat loss. Unfortunately, since they live in those tropical forests, they are degraded a lot. There's deforestation. Their habitat is literally just cut down. So that is one of the main things that has affected them. Their habitat has gone down to about 6% what it once was. So honestly, there just isn't that much space, not as much space as there used to be. That's one thing that has affected them. Another, and this is similar to the tarantula, is a lot of them were taken for the illegal pet trade. So it is not legal to have a monkey as a pet, but a lot of them were taken from the wild for that illegal pet trade. Now, the final thing that really affected their numbers was decades ago, back in the 60s, 70s, up to 40,000 cotton top tamarinds were taken from the wild and used for biomedical research. Now that might seem like a lot of monkeys and it definitely is 40,000 taken from their habitat. You might wonder why were people so interested in them? Why did they need them for research? Cotton top tamarins are actually the only primate other than humans, other than ourselves, that can spontaneously develop colon cancer. So they were studied quite extensively for that. Now, in the 70s, about 1976 to be exact, the IUCN noticed that they were in serious trouble. So they actually stopped being able to take them from the wild, stopped taking them from the wild for that research. However, it was kind of too little too late at that point, unfortunately. And it left those cotton top tamarins in uh, the serious trouble that they are in today. Um, but before you feel too sad about it, remember that we do have these animals here at the museum as part of that species survival plan that Corey was telling you guys about. So the goal of that species survival plan is to increase the numbers of these animals in captivity. So right now in AZA or Association of Zoos and Aquariums, in zoos throughout the country, there's about 80 different zoos that participate in the cotton top tamarind species survival plan. And overall, we have about 300 monkeys in captivity. So the goal of that SSP right now is mainly to just get those numbers up in captivity in these zoos. Since their habitat is still in a lot of trouble, unfortunately, we're not at a point that we can release these animals just yet. Um, but I like to be kind of optimistic about the future and hope that maybe something that can happen someday. Now, just really quickly, because I know there are a lot of questions I want to get to, brief history on our two monkeys. You have been looking at two monkeys. I know they're moving really quickly. It might be hard to tell. We have a male and a female pair. Our male has actually been at the museum for about seven years now, um, or maybe like five or six years. And then our female actually has only been here at the museum since October. Um, so they have been only together for these couple months and they're doing quite well together. Now, I know there are a ton of questions, Becca, so why don't I transition to some of those right now? 
Sure. And luckily you already answered a few of them about, are they males or females? So we've got one of each here. <laughs> we do have one of each. Now the male, um, right now they're actually shifting in, uh, they have a smaller uh, shift cage that they sometimes like to hop uh, into. The male is actually not visible right now. So you're looking at the female. She's actually uh, a little bigger, a little bulkier, has kind of fluffier hair. He is a lot more slender. So maybe when you guys see them hop in and out of the frame now, you'll be able to spot some of those differences. Very cool. Now we have some of the classic questions with a lot of people, including Lila and Vivian, both age nine or almost age nine in, in Lila's case. Uh, they're wondering what is the name of this animal? Our male is named Darwin uh, and our female is named Jane. Uh, we actually did a voting contest uh, that we posted on Facebook and uh, Jane was the winning name. So we named her here at the museum when she got here. Awesome. I love that. Uh, and we have people wondering um, how long can they live for? And specifically, we had a question about what is their average lifespan in the wild and in a zoo? So their lifespan tends to be longer in zoos. Uh, if you think about it, it's a lot easier to survive when someone's taking care of you. You don't have to worry about predators. So their average lifespan in zoos is into the teens. 14, 15, I've heard the longest lived was 24, but that would be a really elderly monkey. In the wild, if they're able to make it to adulthood, I would say an average lifespan would be maybe seven to 10 years. So definitely shorter, um, but it's pretty hard to survive even to adulthood when you're a tiny monkey. <laughs> definitely. Now, a lot of people are uh, wondering um, sort of, how fast can they go and why are they going so fast? <laughs> I think you're noticing, I wouldn't say complete top speed right now, but you've seen some pretty fast movements that they've been doing over the past several minutes. I don't know that we have it clocked since they are arboreal, meaning they spend all of their time up in trees. It's not like they're just running across the ground and you can easily, easily measure that speed. Um, but they do move very quickly um, from treetop to treetop. And really in the wild, that would be their best method of escaping from predators. Just that quick movement, hopping from branch to branch. Um, they are very skilled. They are very adept. Uh, you actually just saw a really good, uh, really good example of that in action. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a clocked top speed for you, but you are seeing some pretty swift movements right now. And if you think about it, these monkeys are enjoying visiting with Corey right now because she's giving them treats. So it's not like they're trying to get away from her and this is how quickly they're moving, just moving around in there. So imagine if they were trying to get away from an animal. They are pretty fast. Um, so many, many, many people have also asked, what do they eat? But specifically Janelle H10 is wondering, are they herbivores or carnivores? So they are actually both. They are what are known as omnivores. So they eat a little bit of everything. You might be wondering what exactly is Corey feeding them that is keeping them so focused on her and so excited. They are getting an extra special treat right now, which are mealworms. So basically beetle larva, that is one of their favorites. So in the wild, insects would be a huge portion of their diet. They would find a lot of grubs and in insects definitely. But they will eat a lot of fruits as well. So that uh, plays into that whole omnivore thing. So they eat both plants and animals. Um, they might eat parts of trees, sap, nectar that they find. Um, they're pretty what we call opportunistic. So pretty much anything they come across, they're going to try to eat. Uh, again, a lot of insects. Here at the museum, they actually eat a couple canned foods that are specially made for monkeys in captivity. So it provides them with a lot of nutrients. They get a lot of different fruits and vegetables. Uh, I will say Jane is very partial to grapes. That's one of her favorite things. Darwin is pretty uh, partial to banana. That's one of his favorites. But they will eat a variety of fruits and vegetables. Uh, they have a pretty good diet here at the museum. Looks like they eat pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, a few people are wondering where they came from. I know you mentioned that Jane only came to us in October. 
Yeah, very interesting question. So since these animals are from uh, the species survival plan, typically we acquire them from other zoos. Uh, so sometimes what happens uh, is maybe a zoo has a couple babies and they just have too many monkeys now in their zoo, so they need to place one somewhere else. So we actually got Darwin several years ago from another zoo to be a companion with a lone female that we had. Now, unfortunately, that female has since passed away, so she is no longer here. And then Darwin, he actually lost that companion uh, back in late 2019. So he was actually alone for a little bit of time and we were, the SSP was trying to find him a good companion, trying to find a good mate. And then unfortunately things got pretty delayed with COVID, with the pandemic. So we were pretty delayed in getting uh, our little Jane here. Uh, and actually, believe it or not, Jane came from a zoo in Texas and I actually went to get her. It was really difficult to get her here again because of the pandemic. So I actually flew down to Texas picked her up and drove her back here. Um, so that's why she was a little delayed getting here. Um, but I guess to answer in a, very briefly, we do get the tamarins from other zoos that have those species survival plans. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. And I think uh, we have time for maybe just one more question. Um, quite a few people have wondered what their predators are, including Kimberly. So when they're babies, they're even smaller than they are right now. I know you're probably getting a pretty good sense of how big they are by seeing kind of Corey's hands next to them. Even full size, they're pretty tiny, under a pound. So if you could picture a baby at a quarter of that size, pretty much anything. Birds of prey would definitely be able to get them. Even large snakes in their habitat. Um, they come to low branches. Big predatory cats would be able to get them. Um, so they do have lots of predators, uh, definitely fewer as they get bigger, but again, even at full size, they're still pretty tiny. Great. Well, thank you so much, Liz and Corey, for your excellent information and for sharing these animals with us today. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time. So I will ask you both to say your goodbyes. Bye, thank you for that awesome information. Now, I'm also gonna share my screen one more time so that we have a little bit more information on the cotton top tamarins. Again, there were a lot of questions that we didn't have time for, so I apologize. We had about 96 unanswered questions. You had so many amazing ones. Um, but hopefully this gives you a little bit more information about our cotton top tamarin, and you can take a picture of this and uh, you're able to learn a little bit more. All right, hopefully you got your chance to get a picture. I wanna thank all of you for being here today and for asking such amazing questions and making some great observations of our animals today. If you enjoyed this and would like to come back to any other presentations that we have from the Museum of Science, you can head to mos.org slash mos at home to check out a full list of our virtual offerings. If you enjoyed this program and are able and willing to support the museum for programs like this, you can head to engage Dot, uh, mos org slash welcome. Once again, thank you all very, very much for being here and have a great rest of your day.